So today I'd love to talk about Quick City, which is a new meta framework built on top of Quick. My name is Adam Bradley. I'm the director of technology at Builder.io. And previously I worked on projects such as Ionic, Stencil, and Parttown is another project of ours that we're working on. So today I'd like to talk a little bit more about Quick and how it's working with Quick City. So what is a meta framework? So for example, Gatsby and Next.js are both meta frameworks built on top of React.js. And Svelkit is built on top of, you guessed it, Svelte. And Nux is built on top of Vue.js. So some of the common features that a meta framework would provide would be something like file or directory based routing, data fetching, server side rendering or SSR, static site generation or SSG. But the biggest thing that I think it provides would be the developer experience and tooling that it adds. So for example, you absolutely could build a high quality React.js app without one of these meta frameworks. However, it provides all of the developer experience and the tooling to make it much easier for developers to bust out and create a high quality application as quickly as possible. Now, Quick City is, you guessed it, the meta framework for Quick. Now, it has many of the traditional features that you expect in a meta framework, such as routing, data fetching, SSR, SSG. But what I really like to talk about is what makes Quick City different and also why we're able to score so well in Lighthouse scores and page speed scores. A limitation commonly seen in many of today's meta frameworks would have to be their poor time to interactivity, or TTI. The amount of time it takes for the page to become interactive can often be attributed to the underlying framework's use of hydration but also comes down to the framework's heavy reliance on JavaScript to get the app up and running. Basically, the low-level frameworks have a lot of baggage which the meta frameworks have to deal with. There's just too much reliance on JavaScript. But is site performance really a problem? Well, the answer is yes. Actually, a better way to put it is a faster performing site will increase your conversion rates, whatever those may be. Now, I'm not gonna read each of these individually, but the web is packed full of case studies like these showing that the faster your site is, the more your conversion rates improve, such as increased sales, more signups, less users leaving your site, and many, many more case studies. So yes, a faster site can make a large impact for your organization. When you see the core web vital scores of many of today's top websites, you'll notice many struggle to create a fast website for low end mobile devices. But what's deceiving is that these same sites work just fine on a high speed desktop device throughout development. However, when we're out in the real world, trying to load a website on our mobile devices, we're all quick to give up and hit the back button after a short period of time. Basically, we're not willing to wait on a slow website. We're instead going to find one that's fast. So we ran Core Web Vitals on the top 50 e-commerce sites, only to find out that most of them are in the red and actually quite slow on mobile devices. But hold on here. Remember all those case studies? Many of these case studies prove time and time again that site performance can benefit site conversion rates. So to help research why sites are struggling with performance, at Builder.io, we created a performance insight tool where it's able to try out different test experiments. Basically, the tool tries different experiments to see which optimization makes the biggest performance impact. For example, it tests out how fast your site could be if you optimized only images or only CSS or only JavaScript, or how fast your site could be if all of the optimizations were applied. In this test, we're able to see that the site's current score is a 36 out of 100. If we were to optimize all of the images, it still gets a 36. If we were to optimize all of the CSS, it's still a 36. However, if we were to optimize the site's JavaScript, you'll see that the drastic difference is now a score of 96. And if we did every single optimization, the score is now 97. By breaking apart the test like this, you can see that JavaScript is by far where the time and effort should go to optimize page performance. So we ran the same test on many of the top websites out there. And just like our previous test, it actually shows that if you were to optimize the images and the CSS, there's only a small impact to performance. However, there is a massive difference for all of these websites if only the JavaScript was optimized. This shows that if you're going to invest resources into improving performance, basically it's best to first focus on JavaScript. And it only seems to be getting worse with time. According to HTTP Archive, the amount of JavaScript on a mobile site has increased over 700% in the last 10 years, and the trend is only going up. You can see that there's a correlation between the sites becoming more interactive which requires adding more JavaScript. But sadly, however, JavaScript is the biggest culprit to slow sites. So who is responsible for slow sites? Could it be the developers that create and maintain the sites? Or is it the tooling which developers use? Or are the underlying frameworks themselves the ones that are dragging down performance? It's pretty common that developers are often given the blame here. As the old saying goes, a developer can make a slow site no matter what the framework. 
But I'd like to review this a bit and wonder if it's not the developer, but rather the mental model which today's traditional frameworks are based on top of. The current trend is linear. Added functionality means added JavaScript, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. But what if we could break apart this correlation? What if no matter how much functionality you add to a site, the startup cost would stay the same, and the time to interactivity would stay the same? We've created two projects that help take the site performance problem head on. One of them is dedicated to improving third party scripts called Party Town. A third party script is code from another domain, which you do not have control over, but still is running alongside your application. Some examples include Google Analytics, Facebook Pixel, A-B testing services, and many, many more. They notoriously destroy site performance, but there's little developers can do about it because the data from these services are extremely valuable to organizations. But rather than letting third-party scripts compete for resources with your application, it instead runs these scripts from another thread using a web worker. And by doing so, the main thread is dedicated to your application, and the third-party scripts are offloaded to a background task. This is a simple diagram showing that instead of all of the scripts sharing one thread and continuously blocking each other, Python can instead offload many third-party scripts to their own web worker thread. Now, Python is still experimental, but so far has been proving to make some large performance gains. Now, this talk is about Quick and Quick City, but there's plenty more to learn about with Python, so I encourage you to take a look at this open source project. But let's get back to Quick. So while Partytown addresses the third-party script problem, Quick addresses the first-party script problem. These are our two open source projects we're working on to help speed up sites. Now, first-party code means your code, the code which you have control over. This also includes the framework code being imported, the components being written, and the main scripts being executed from your site. But immediately the question is, why is Quick any different? There are hundreds of frameworks out there that say that they're the fastest. How is Quick actually different from one of today's popular frameworks. This leads us back to one of our earlier topics regarding the mental model of today's frameworks. Basically, many of the popular frameworks today use hydration to start up a server-side rendered application. The big difference is that most of today's frameworks are replayable, whereas Quick is resumable. Okay, so now you're like, what the heck? Why are we just making up words here? Well, let me try out an analogy. Think of a virtual machine, where in the first machine you can run an application to a certain point, then freeze dry the application state and hand it off to another machine. The second machine is able to pick up exactly where the first one left off. This is very similar to what resumability is for Quick. The server is able to generate the HTML and within it include the application's current state, which means how the page is currently rendered, depending on the URL or any other parameters. At this point, the HTML is like a VM where we freeze this app, send it to the browser, and the browser can pick right back up to where the server left off. It's not that Quick had to reload the app to a certain point, it simply continued from where the server left off. Now, hydration is entirely different in that the application needs to run twice, once on the server and then once on the browser. After the server renders the HTML, it ships the content to the browser like you'd expect. However, the client or the browser has to replay everything the server already did. It needs to again execute the application so it can get back to the point where the server left it off. So before the application can start to handle any user interactivity, the browser first needs to download the app's JavaScript, replay the app logic, rebuild the VDOM, and then diff the VDOM. And this is all before the user interaction can start to kick in. This is why we call it replayable and not resumable. It needs to replay the app a second time to get it up and running again and back to the same state the server left it off at. You can see the hydration cost yourself with some performance profiling. This long running task here and all the work the application is having to do at startup is the hydration process. And remember, to even get to this point, we first have to download the framework and parse the scripts. And during hydration, it's having to re-render an already rendered application. This is one of Quick's biggest differences here. The app has already rendered, so Quick has no work to do at this point. It doesn't even have to download the app or framework at this point, and it doesn't have to re-render the application. This is where Quick uses resumability and not hydration. There's no initialization code rendering, diffing, or setting up listeners just for it to run on the client. It picks up right where it left off. If you step back at this point, you might say that this is no different than what PHP or Rails were doing. They server-side rendered the HTML and browsers immediately rendered the content. But what's different is that for any interactivity to be integrated, you'd use something like jQuery. But what we learned from that is that it came at a cost of keeping the server and client-side code wired up correctly. Even though it was the same application, there was a server model and a client model to keep in sync. The current form of development has drastically improved the developer experience of, say, 15 years ago. 
Frameworks have unified the model, improved the development practices, and improved how we scale complexity. However, these framework origins come from creating single-page applications. The server-side rendered aspect of today's frameworks were more or less an afterthought and only became popular in the last few years. The underlying frameworks, which meta-frameworks are built on top of, were not built from the ground up considering SSR first. This is where we're hoping to see the next generation of frameworks go next. Wiz is one of Google's internal frameworks doing this, and this is what powers products like Gmail. Marco 6 has been doing this for a while now too, and is an open source project from eBay. Quick is what we've been working on as a way to combine React-like development experience with resumability. It's as if React was built from the ground up considering SSR first. All right, what about Quick City? Where does it come in? So again, Quick City is the meta framework built on top of Quick. So all of Quick's benefits of resumability and an extremely fast time to interactive is also true for Quick City applications. But what's unique here with this meta framework is that because it's leveraging Quick's core feature, that means there's actually very little runtime involved at all with Quick City. Now, Quick City comes with many of the expected features of a meta framework, routing probably being one of the most important. It uses directory-based routing, which is similar to Next.js's recent proposal and Svelkit's latest updates. Below is an example of a typical directory structure within the source routes directory. To make a route, the directory should have an index file, and the file's hierarchy of directory names is what creates the URL path. Directory names can also be used to read params within segments of the URL path. Another common feature would be nested layouts, which is basically the ability to wrap page content with the layouts found in parent directories. Now, Quick City's nested and named layouts are absolutely inspired by SvelteKit, and its grouped layouts are inspired by Next.js's latest proposal. But another feature it provides is a top layout, which is a way to not inherit parent layouts, but instead stop at a certain level. One feature where QuickCity really shines is request handling and its integration with existing servers. Request and response handling is a core feature. And what I really like about it is it kind of brings us back to the basics of an HTTP server. Each page can create its own on get or on post request handlers and provide their own logic on what to do. This would include being able to provide authentication, HTTP status, redirecting, or handling form submissions. This also includes being able to use a resource component, which is found in Quick Core. By combining request handlers to load data and the resource component to render the data, it provides a great utility to seamlessly communicate between the back end and front end. The same resource component also makes it easy to asynchronously load client side. This resource component also makes it easy to asynchronously load data at client side while also showing a loading spinner until it's resolved. And the same request handler API is available for any route, not just routes that return HTML. So for example, the same request handler API can be used for just an endpoint API returning JSON data or whatever the developer chooses. In this example, the source file exports an onGet function and a default component. While the onGet only runs on the server, the component runs on both the server and the client. To connect the two worlds, the component calls the use endpoint utility from Quick. What's great is that the types also naturally flow between the two different worlds. The product data interface returned by the onGet is also correctly typed within the component renderer. Up until this point, we've talked about fairly common features of a meta framework. When numerous meta frameworks are built on top of the same framework and each offers the same features, it's getting kind of difficult for one to be drastically improved over the other. And again, this falls back to using the traditional framework mental model. What's unique about Quick City is not any slight differences in the meta framework features, but rather how it's able to take advantage of the Quick framework itself. One that's been fun to build out is its ability to actively prefetch any potential execution pass. Now, developers will often point out that lazy loading on demand causes latency issues, which is usually true. However, Quick avoids this by actively prefetching what's possible. But that absolutely does not mean that we're prefetching most of the application, only what's needed. So for example, if the only thing a user can do is click a button, then that's the only module prefetched. In this example, the browser wouldn't download any render code or even the quick framework itself. It only prefetched the possible listener. And instead of using the link tag for prefetching, Quick City instead uses the cache API, which actually offers better support compared to the link rel module preload. And all this happens within a background task using a service worker. And because we're able to intercept requests, and understand the app's module graph, we can also reduce the network waterfalls by starting off 
all the imports we know an interaction will need at the same time. Actively prefetched in application as a user navigates an app is kind of like the concept of video streaming. For example, if Netflix had you downloading movies, you'd have to first wait for the entire movie to finish downloading before you could start watching the opening credits. However, Netflix, YouTube, Hulu, and all the other video services instead have you stream the video as you watch it. This means customers are only prefetching the content just before they need it. I'd like to think that Quick's active prefetching is quite similar, and that it's only actively prefetching the next possible interactions as the user is interacting with their application. Now, static site generation is something that many, many great projects can already do. Where Quick is different here is its ability to add a heavy amount of interactivity, but without a large JavaScript overhead. One of the reasons some frameworks prefer client-side routing is because it's expensive to do a full page reload. But because there is no hydration cost for Quick, then each page load is extremely cheap, no matter if it's one component or 50 components on the page. So with Quick, it's still easy to create a multiple page application, an MPA, while also adding in a heavy amount of interactivity. Next is server-side rendering, or SSR. By default, QuickCity is able to stream content back to the user just as HTTP intended for it to work. This is in contrast to many frameworks that will block until an entire single HTML string is completed. Because Quick's renderer is async, it's able to stream back large chunks of completed HTML as it's finished. This means that the document head and a page shell can immediately respond with its HTML, while the product data can still be loading from a database. And when the product finishes loading, the HTTP stream will continue with the completed HTML. But a traditional SSR setup often has its own performance issues from the very beginning. Because the framework is always rendering the entire tree for every request, this becomes very expensive for the server. As you can see here, Amazon stated that they simply could not use React SSR because, in their words, it wasn't fast enough. So this is heavy on our minds as we don't want to fall into the same performance issues React SSR has. This is where I'm excited about a hybrid approach of mixing static generated content and dynamically rendered content. It's really difficult to get anything faster than SSG. It's basically already rendered and no work needs to be done. With SSR, however, usually the entire tree needs to render because the application isn't sure what's static or dynamic. However, with Quick's optimizer, it does contain this information and it does know what's static and what's dynamic. This means that while generating SSR renderer code, we can create modules that are largely pre-rendered strings of the content. It's not having to render the entire tree, but rather concatenate all of the static parts, which could be most of the page, and dynamically render the small sections. This would be ideal for personalization, where 100% of the users could see the same product content, but small sections of the page will be personalized to the user. Another realization we've had with Quick is that the lines have blurred a little bit between a multiple page app and a single page app. With a multiple page app, an MPA is great for content heavy websites, like an e-commerce site with product pages. MPAs are great for SEO and fast loading times. Alternatively, a single page app or an SPA is great for complex applications and immediate user feedback, like a dashboard. But with Quick, the downsides of each approach is less of a problem. And rather than having to make an MPA versus SPA decision at the very beginning of the project, every single user interaction can make the decision if it should be an MPA or SPA. So all of this can ask the question of why? Why is Builder working on open source software directed at improving web page performance? And all of it circles back to our project, Builder.io, with the goal of easily scoring 100 out of 100 no matter what you throw at it. So Builder.io is our visual CMS you can integrate into any existing stack, such as React, Vue, or Angular. But with Quick and Part Town, we feel we can push Builder's performance even further by rethinking how you can integrate into CMS into your stack. That's all I have for now. So this was a fairly short talk, so I apologize for running through some concepts and completely skipping over others. But it'd be great if you could test it out for yourself. You can start a Quick City app by using npm create quick at latest, and it'll only take a minute and you can inspect the performance for yourself. At the very least, I encourage you to take a look at our docs and run through some of the examples and tutorials. Thank you for your time, and please feel free to ping me on Twitter and Discord. Thank you.